Well, good for you, having come out to church on such a hot day. Uh, the pews are a little less uh, full than last week, and I gather that's because there's a big online congregation to welcome. Um, you're sitting at home in front of your air conditioner. So uh, whether you're joining us online or in person, uh, good morning. And we open our worship with some verses from Psalm 104 and 105. Please join in the parts that say P or all. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. When the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, the people asked, and he brought quails and gave them food from heaven in abundance. For the Lord remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. Praise the Lord. And let's sing to God's praise our first hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Let's unite our hearts in prayer before God. Let us pray. Lord of heaven and earth, we gather here for worship once again. We know only a fraction of what you have going on in the vast sweep of your works and of your providence. And when it comes to you yourself, we have the problem of only being able to use the superlatives of all the categories we know all wise, all powerful, all loving. But they do not do justice, for you are literally a God beyond compare. Yet we are given to know that what you are is good. Who you are is someone who is for us, for you gave yourself to the world in Jesus Christ. And as he walked among us, we met someone who was the ideal of a human being and in whose perfect balance of justice and compassion, we came to know something of what you are like. Lord, prepare the ground of our hearts for worship this day. For we are weak and we are sinful. And before the end of this service, we fear we shall also be very hot. 
That is what it is like for us, Lord. Six parts holy intention and four parts flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. As we think about the sacraments this morning that you have graciously given to your church as accommodations to our weakness, so that we may grasp with firmer hands the eternal grace, we confess the sins of forgetfulness and insufficient gratitude. As an affluent people with comfortable lives, we are exactly like the Israelites of old who you warned would forget the God of their deliverance when they had moved into a land good and broad, full of wells they had not dug and houses they had not built. Indeed, Lord, we take you and so much of the miracle of everyday existence entirely for granted. And we are self-centered. We tend to view the other people in our lives as those who can be useful to us, means to our ends, as opposed to those we have the opportunity to bless. Forgive us, Lord, for all that we have done and for the things we fail to do, for all the ways we have fallen short of the ideal we see in the humanity of Jesus Christ, our sins of thought and word and deed. Hear us now as we address to you our private confession. Lord, by your Spirit, may we truly have sorrow for our sins and strength to turn from them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends, hear the good news from the book of Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. St. Paul adds that if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. Everything old has passed away, and everything has become new. All this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. Thanks be to God. Welcome, Debbie, and uh, she will sing for us on holy ground. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Debbie. Let's approach God again in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are full of wonder at this world of beauty in which you set us, at the sense of meaning and poignancy of life which grows upon us, the older we get. Yet we are also aware of the other truth, that change and decay in all around we see. There is a worm in everything, and even our highest joys are fleeting. But in these reflections we are driven to an even deeper gratitude and higher praise because we know through the revelation of your gospel that you are in the world reconciling everything that is out of joint. You are in the world reconciling estranged humanity to yourself. You are in the world working your purpose out until everything in our field of sense and vision will be as full of your glory as the waters that cover the sea. We thank you especially for health for the stability of life that we know in this nation, for freedom of opportunity and education. We thank you for the abundance of all of the things we need for daily life, and also much that we merely want. We thank you for friends and family, also for our pets for the joys which open to us as we delve deeper into all things that you have created good, and for the peace you offer us in an anxious age of knowing that we belong to you in life and in death. We thank you for satisfying work and delightful play, for the rhythms of growing tired and of restoration through rest and sleep. Lord, we pray for all this day who are excluded from any of the good things that we've just named. For all who know the trials of ill health, of chronic pain, of disturbance of mind and disintegration of body. We pray again especially for the Reverend Gordon Matheson who once ministered to this congregation who it appears is coming through a period of grave illness. We thank and praise you for his recovery. And we pray that as he and his wife undertake a move that you would go before them and continue to strengthen them. 
Lord, we pray for those who mourn, who have lost loved ones, who know the world as a less secure place because of death, the thief in the night who can come at any time. And we fear that life will never appear in color again, for a light has gone out. We pray for parents and for teachers as only a fortnight remains now until the return to schools and university. On this island, there has been much less disruption than in many places to education. And so we pray for jurisdictions where there has been great disruption and for policymakers as they take difficult decisions about what it will mean to enter the learning environment safely. As we look out on the world this morning, we pray for the people of Haiti, that much beleaguered country, the world's poorest nation. We pray for emergency workers there as the living are sought among the ruins. We also pray for the people of Afghanistan, especially women and children who know the most repressive edge of the Taliban's evil ideology. For those who have fought in war there, including many Canadians, and who must be feeling the fruitlessness of sacrificial endeavor. Lord, as most of Canada looks forward to reopening and the restoration of our once and future freedoms, we think of those still fighting in our hospitals and in our labs. We think of the great many cases of suffering and dying people in the U.S., and we continue to pray for wisdom for our leaders here at home and strength for frontline workers. And finally, Lord, we pray for the church, both in its gathered identity and in its dispersion. We pray for the witness of individual Christians, especially those facing persecution, or as is more often the case with us, just difficult situations in which it is easy to betray our ideals. We pray that you would raise up ministers of quality as laborers for the harvest, fresh voices that would know how to address the Christian message to this generation. We pray for the ministry of Christian parents and Christian educators as they seek to be faithful and fulfill the task of handing on the faith. As increasingly we find ourselves as part of a subculture in a world of pluralism and diversity, we pray that you would teach us how to stand out in the right way for Christ, to resist the pressures of the world to squeeze us into its mold, and yet to exhibit grace and generosity rather than fear and reactive retreat under such pressures. We pray for the ministry of this congregation and for its minister, Reverend Doug, and his wife, Dana, as they return from holiday into a congregational life that is moving at high speed with many demands. We pray for relationships here, for the work of the staff and for the vision of the leadership, giving you such thanks for the happy moment at which this congregation finds itself an exception to so much of the decline and depression in small churches around us and across the nation and the denomination. Lord, we trust that as you have been our creator, you are also the one who rules over this world. And though the wrong seems off so strong, you are the ruler yet. We thank you for this hope and for the invitation to bring all that is in our hearts, little and large concerns, before the throne of your grace. We gather all our prayers into the great prayer that Christ, our Lord, has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen.
Our next hymn is a communion hymn. We're not celebrating communion today, but we are talking about it in the sermon. All who hunger gather gladly. Again, Debbie will still our hearts for worship. Whoa! 
Thank you very much, Debbie, for sharing your gift with us. Also, thank you to Tom, who's been collaborating on worship the last couple of weeks. Um, we're all uh, substitute people um, this, uh, during this time of holiday, but uh, we thank you that you've made us welcome. I keep waiting for somebody to advance that slide, and then I realize it's me. The um, scripture reading from the Gospel of John, I'm not going to read in, in full, it's rather long, and I think it's a familiar part of scripture, it's where Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fishes, and feeds the multitude, and then afterward has a big conversation about being the bread of life. Our other scripture reading comes from the letter of Paul to the Corinthians, the first letter reading chapter 10 and 11 selected verses. Hear the word of God. I do not want you to be aware, bro unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under a cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Therefore, dear friends, flee from the worship of idols. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. When you come together, it is not really the Lord's Supper that you eat. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I command you? In this matter, I do not command you. Examine yourselves, and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. Rather, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come, Holy Spirit, as we open this word and bind it to our hearts. Grant that I may speak faithfully now in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Last weekend, as I drove around the island, one of the things which was a delight to see were the blue herons, sometimes 20 or 30 of them standing in the shallows, very still, patiently fishing. I wondered if the reason that those blue herons were blue is that they eat the shells of PEI mussels and other gray-blue shellfish. I don't know if that's true, but in the tropics there is another kind of bird, 
long-legged, similar to the blue heron, called the scarlet ibis, which I had the privilege of seeing when I visited Trinidad. We had to paddle in past these tree boas and caiman and mangrove trees, which grew in the swamp, to get to a central lake. At first, there was nothing to look at except a stand of trees, but as if on cue at 5 p.m., the scarlet ibis started flying in, huge flocks of them. What a sight, streaks of red flashing across the blue of the sky and then roosting in the trees until the green foliage was so full of them that it looked like a Christmas tablecloth. There were also a few white birds, which we learned were juvenile scarlet ibis. You see, scarlet ibis are not scarlet to begin with. They develop that color because of the carotene in the shells of the shellfish that they eat. We all know that expression, you are what you eat, but this may actually be the best example I've ever come across of it actually literally being true. Along with being baptized, Christians are people who eat the Lord's Supper. But what does that mean for the kind of people that we are? For the scarlet ibis, there is no hiding it. What that bird eats is obvious by its plumage. But is it obvious when people meet us as Christians that we are fed on a regular diet of the sacramental bread and wine? And what would that even mean? Well, that's what I want to think about with you together this morning. The roots of our Christian sacrament of the Lord's Supper go back to the Old Testament, to the story of God and his redemption of his people Israel through sla from slavery in Egypt and his shaping of them through 40 years of wilderness wandering to be his nation of kings and priests, his light to the Gentiles. In that Old Testament story, there are two occasions when special attention is paid to what the people eat. The first is the meal that is eaten on the night of the Exodus, which becomes a ritual meal of remembrance in Jewish tradition. Originally, the centerpiece of that meal was the lamb, whose blood spared the people from the plague of the firstborn. It also came to include unleavened bread in memory of the bread which didn't get a chance to rise because the people were on the move making their exodus. And it came to include four cups of wine in memory of the promises that God made in Exodus chapter 6 verses 6 and 7 to save his people. As the Jews partook of that meal annually, they got formed in a spirituality of grace and gratitude, in a spirituality and theology of atonement, at one meant. When Jesus shared his last Passover with his disciples, it was the same, only he established for Christian practice only a meal of bread and wine, because he was the lamb who made the atonement. For us, as for the Jews, the meal forms us in ways of grace and gratitude. We know ourselves as a people reconciled to God, made at one by the atonement of the Lamb of God, and so made ministers and ambassadors of reconciliation. The second Old Testament meal, which fills in our understanding of the Lord's Supper and how it forms us, is the meal of manna and quail that God provided morning and evening to the Israelites as they wandered in the wilderness. Now manna was a strange food in a number of ways. It could not be stored overnight except on the Sabbath. And even though some people gathered much of it and some people only a little, when all Israel sat to eat there was enough so that everyone had some and no one had too much. The way God fed his people, fed them by hand during those wilderness years, formed them as a people who depended on God and as a people who discerned the body, who ate as a collective, none having too much, none going without. In John's Gospel, unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
the teaching of the Lord's Supper comes not on Passover night, but way earlier in Jesus' ministry in John chapter 6. And it's there that we get the idea of incorporation with Christ through sharing the Lord's Supper. Jesus says there, I am the bread of life. Feed on me. Unless you feed on my body and drink of my blood, you have no life in you. Feed on my body and drink my blood, and I will raise you up on the last day. And it's ideas of sharing with Christ that informs Paul's teaching about communion in chapters 10 and 11 of 1 Corinthians. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing, a communion in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a sharing, a communion in the body of Christ? The problem Paul has with the Christians in Corinth, and maybe you gathered from the tone of that reading that he's not very happy with them in that passage, is that they are not sharing in any real sense when they gather at the Lord's table. They take the sacrament, but it doesn't change them into a community at one, either with Christ or with one another. As we daily feed on Christ, we are meant to be formed in ways of dependence on God and openness toward the other, because God's provision is sufficient for everyone. Now, for the rest of this sermon, I want to share some communion stories Stories personal to me, specific to the congregation that I served for 15 years in Guelph. And in one case, specific to Zion, which I consider to be the church where I worship now, albeit at a distance. But these little glimpses of what communion can mean in the life of a Christian and in the life of a church, I hope will illustrate those things I've just been saying about the, from the scriptures that communion forms us to live in an exchange of grace and gratitude. It forms us to live as a people reconciled and reconciling. And it forms us in openness to the other because God's provision is enough, enough to convert a stranger to a friend. In my own life and spirituality, communion is the primary way, along with the word of scripture, that Christ has touched me. I'm not a person who can boast of a lot of religious experience. I've never experienced a dramatic and instantaneous physical healing. I've never had dreams or visions that have clarified the future. I've never seen an angel. But I do have one memory of a time when I was involved in a celebration of communion at a church where I was pastoral assistant. This was when I was a grad student in Scotland over 20 years ago now. And of course, I've been involved in many celebrations of communion before and since. But never have I felt the direct, personal outpouring of Christ's love over me that I felt on that occasion. I knew that I was known and seen by him, that his self-giving was for me, and in that moment I felt that there was nothing that I would withhold from him in return. That experience has always stood for me as what it means to be caught up in the exchange of grace and gratitude with the Lord, his grace being poured out, lavished over us and our gratitude rising to him in response. At the congregation in Guelph that I served for 15 years, communion continued to be important. In the early years, the communion liturgy that I used included a moment when we would invite people to walk around the church greeting one another with the words, peace of Christ, and a handshake or an embrace. After the prayer of confession, I would say these words, and people knew they were coming, so perhaps they would take an opportunity in, in the week before to prepare for them. God has made his peace with us in Christ. It is important before we approach the table to be at peace with one another, too. 
The Gospel says that if anyone goes to the temple to offer sacrifice and has an issue with his brother, let him go and make peace with his brother first. Christ, who has forgiven us everything, makes it possible for us to forgive one another and to live as a community of peace. We show this when we share a sign of peace one with another. Now I found in practice that that was easier to maintain in the early phase of my ministry when I had suffered no injuries or disappointments at the hand of my congregational members and when there was no family among them who had any grievances or disappointments with me. But as it became more difficult to meet the eye of certain people during the passing of the peace, it was a practice that became all the more important. I don't know if people still take as seriously um, as we used to preparation for communion. But in the old days, when communion Sundays were announced several weeks in advance, you got a visit from your elder checking on your spiritual health, and they would give you a communion token which you would submit the Sunday that you came to church. And then there was a preparatory service on Friday night, usually before the communion. And then the knowledge that communion Sunday was coming would act as a goad to seek peace in any relationship where there was friction. The Bible tells us to keep short accounts, to not let the sun go down on our anger. Well, 24 hours is a short shelf life for anger, but even if we can't manage that, wouldn't it be good if we allowed no issue to go unaddressed for any longer than the period between one celebration of communion and the next? That is one of the ways in which being a people who partake regularly at the table of the Lord is supposed to form us. Our response to grace is not only gratitude back to God, but a paying forward to our neighbor of the forgiveness that we have received so abundantly from God, and which each celebration of communion seals on us anew. Over the years at my church in Guelph, there were times when I felt the spirit of communion, the communion table, extend beyond the actual celebrations of communion itself. It was not, it's not always possible or appropriate to share the sacrament of Holy Communion with every one of our neighbors. It is for the baptized and it's for those who acknowledge Christ as Savior and Lord. But when we partake at the table of the Lord, it forms us and it changes us such that we have a different attitude toward all our neighbors, all our neighbors. It allows us to see one another not as threat, but as opportunity. Maybe there's someone I can bless. Maybe here is a relationship that could open up into something wonderful in which God has a purpose. Why do we regard other people as threat? Usually it's because we're afraid that they will take what we have or that they will take over that we will lose our control. But what if we were a people formed by a 40-year-long diet of daily manna, this food that you could not hoard, so your control was all gone, the security that you could hoard for yourself. And yet this food God was faithful to give, new every morning, and always in a quantity just sufficient, whether you gathered a little or gathered a lot. There was no scarcity. In 2015, our congregation was approached about sharing its building with another congregation, a congregation of Pentecostals. Initially, there was a lot of fear how much of our space within the building of which we had previously had sole proprietorship, even if it was underused, would we have to give up in order to enter this arrangement? What would we have to change? It turned out that we had to change our worship time by, an hour, by half an hour 
And at one point, it looked as if that would be so unthinkable that it would end the negotiations right there. But we entered the arrangement, and it was to our great mutual benefit. The people who once seemed like a threat to fear became a support and an inspiration to us. And the longer we lived with them, the more opportunities God showed us for sharing things together, including even our worship on a few occasions every year. Can I get an amen? I used to love to preach on those occasions to the Pentecostals because you would get an amen. <laughs> By the end of my time in that congregation, we had four churches of different ethnicities meeting under our roof. The Nepalese worshipped sitting on the floor, and the Keralese worshipped with tambourines. The Pentecostals marched around the room when they prayed. It was all very strange to us, very exotic. But we were alive to the opportunity, not to the threat. We were no longer afraid. God had taught us at the table that there is bread enough to share. In 2016, Guelph received an influx of families who were fleeing from war torn Syria. Our congregation partnered with three others and a local philanthropist to sponsor one family. This required us to extend even farther the formation that we had received at the Lord's table as to how we would engage all of our neighbors. For unlike those others who shared the majority of um, the Syrians, including our family, were, were Muslim, and the world, in the world in the world, the most vocal Muslims do breathe threats against the West. And even those who themselves are fleeing radical Islam represent cultural change for us as they arrive with particular dietary and prayer space needs, and often with very large families. In such a world, we can persist, can we persist in the in the lessons that we have learned at the Lord's table, to welcome these neighbors as folk we have the God-given opportunity to bless with the bottomless abundance of blessing that God renews every morning instead of as a threat to be feared. Reflect for a moment on the example that Christ sets us himself in this, who on the night when he was betrayed took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. In the midst of real threat, on the night he was betrayed, enemies were closing in around him. A betrayer was sitting across the table from him, and Jesus still chose to bless the Lord for the bread of the earth and the fruit of the vine, and to bless his friends, including the one who had become his enemy, the betrayer, with the gift not only of bread, but of his whole self. Our church found that in Christ it was possible for us too, and that by it we were blessed. My 15-year ministry with the congregation I served in Guelph wrapped up on August the 2nd last year. COVID gave us a slight reprieve at that time in the summer between the first and the second wave, so it was possible for us to meet again in in-person worship for my last service, and we had the opportunity to share communion uh, together as a congregation and minister using elements in little pre-sealed communion packages. It was incredibly moving as I looked out in love and in the spirit of peace over these people with whom I had shared a life for a decade and a half. Since then, I've been worshipping online, which has been great, but one of my difficulties has been my uncertainty about whether I could really participate in communion when it was offered virtually. I've often watched the digital content from Zion over the years, but last March I got hooked on the reading the Bible together studies from Genesis. If, you're, if you haven't checked those out, they're wonderful, and I would highly recommend them. I was in touch with Reverend Doug about them, and as Zion's communion service on May 30th was approaching, he said to me with some insistence, I hope when we celebrate communion next Sunday that you will join us. And I said, I would like to. I would really, really like to. 
By this point, it had been fully 10 months since my last communion. So I wrote back and said that if I could satisfy three criteria, I could see my way to participating in online communion. I felt that there should be proper elements, bread and wine, not just tortilla chips and Gatorade or whatever happened to be in my cupboard at home. I felt that I should partake in real time when a celebrant was saying the words and when a local congregation was receiving in person. And I felt that I should partake in company with at least one other person. Sitting in isolation behind my computer screen at home, I didn't feel was a true discerning of the body, the Christian body, the church. It wasn't communion in the spirit of the act. So Reverend Doug, probably thinking me hopelessly persnickety, simply encouraged me again, I hope you can join us in communion online. On May 29th, the Saturday before Communion Sunday, in a little talk with God that I had in the morning, I was convicted that I should go to some effort to try to prepare for this communion, to set up conditions which would meet my three criteria. I felt I needed to. I felt at that time that my relationship with God needed this sacrament of covenant renewal. I went shopping for the bread and the wine, easy enough to get proper elements when you think of it beforehand. I resolved to get up in time for the 10.30 worship when Zion was live streaming, also easy enough, although it's 9.30 in Ontario. But where I hit a snag was in trying to gather a community of at least one other person to take communion with me. You would think that would be easy enough in a city of 120,000 in Guelph to find another Christian. But I did not find it so. We were under restrictions at the time of five people or less in social gatherings. I figured I only needed one other person, but in contacting five different friends, none, each for good and legitimate reasons, could agree to come to my house that morning to watch the Zion service and to take communion with me. So Saturday night, I emailed Reverend Doug disappointed and consigned to participating spiritually in communion while the congregation partook. That's what I had done all those months between August 2nd and May 30th. Now God had decided to be gracious to me and to honor my desire to meet with him at the Lord's table. And the way he was gracious to me was in disturbing your minister's sleep. So by 7.30 Sunday morning, Reverend Doug was on the phone to some friends in Kitchener, another city about 30 minutes drive from Guelph, who he knew regularly worshipped online with Zion, and said, I have a friend who needs to come over and take communion with you. Will you welcome her at the church in your garage? At 8.30 a.m., he emails me their address. At 8.48 a.m., I pick up that email. Kitchener, as I said, is 30 minutes drive away, and the service starts at 9.30. So you can do the math. Some panic ensued in my house, and there may have been some speed limits broken. But I arrived at these people's garage at 9.31. Their welcome to me, a total stranger, was extraordinary. Two couples and a dog. So with just one seat empty to make up the maximum Ontario five, the seat that God knew all the while was marked out for me. Communion elements were set out, we were socially distanced, and before us was a big TV screen with Reverend Doug on it at 9.31, just in the midst of giving the announcements. I don't know as I relate this whether it really communicates to you how overwhelmingly gracious that experience was for me. It was to meet with the Lord after so many months in the sacrament, gathered me up again into that exchange of grace and gratitude, and to meet with those good and godly people who had gone so far in learning the lessons of the Lord's table as to regard the stranger not as threat, but as someone they might have the opportunity to bless, to welcome me into their home during COVID, when we didn't welcome anybody into our homes. 
into the circle of their friendship forged in Christ. And not only that, but to say at the end of the service, please join us for church on an ongoing basis. It was overwhelming. Christians, as much as the scarlet ibis, I need to show you this slide of the church in the garage. Um, that's your stained glass window there, which shows at the end of the, the worship service. So Christians, as much as the scarlet ibis, have outward and visible features that are formed and marked by our inward and spiritual diet. When we join regularly at the Lord's table, we learn certain ways the way of living in that exchange of grace and gratitude with God. The way of living as a people reconciled and reconciling, paying forward the forgiveness that we have received from God to others. And the way of openness to others, to the stranger, because we regard others not as threat, but as people we may have the opportunity to bless. These ways are how we feed on Christ, not just four times or eight times a year, but every day. These ways are how we discern Christ's body. These ways are what color our feathers Christ-like through our regular diet of Christ's body and Christ's blood. Thanks be to God. Our hymn is O God of Bethel. Go, people of God, showing your true colors to the world, the colors of grace, the colors of gratitude, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon and abide with each one of you, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>